Amen. Uh, hi, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, if you have a mother or ever had a mother, then uh, Mother's Day should be as special and important to you as it is for that mother. And uh, I'm not going to spend the whole morning talking about mothers, though I could spend the whole week. Um, I would encourage that if you, if you relegate showing appreciation of your mother to your mother to this one day of the year, I encourage you to reevaluate that decision. Uh, just mothers are, uh, mothers are special. Uh, so have you ever had a life verse? Do you know what I'm talking about? That, that verse that just, man, this really speaks to my life and, and in a way that it must not speak to anybody else's. And it is so powerful to me. It's the first one I memorized. It is the thing that, that nearly every day kind of sort of dictates my actions. And, and everybody who has one has their own, okay? I have several, but we're, today we're going to talk about my first my wife Charlotte has one. It's different than mine. You might have one. It'll be different than ours. Or maybe it's the same. But that's what we're going to talk about today. So I was, my birthday is August 20th. Um, write it down. It's important. At the end, you can pick up my birthday wish list. At the, no. Um, my birthday is August 20th. And I bring that up because if you've ever done anything in the realm of education, you know what that means for me. I was the youngest kid in my class always, always, because I just only barely made the cut to have to start the one year back. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so for example, I graduated high school uh, at 17 without graduating early. I did the full, I did the full sentence. Um, and, and graduated at 17. So I'm, I was always the youngest. And then since I've been back in the valley, I've, I've started a business and, and, and I've, I've got this opportunity to come preach for you all every week. And, and I'm still too young to be doing those things. Right? And, and I don't, I'm not trying to like, <laughs> okay, but, but do you see what I'm saying? I, I, I'm always too young for what it is that I that I feel like God is calling me to do. I'm always too young in the position that I'm put in. I'm always too young. And, and I, I didn't get bullied very much, uh, at least not for that. Um, but man, it just really struck me every time I was trying to get into something. You're always too young. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, by the way, I went, to, I went to college before I went into the Air Force, and then I enlisted instead of commissioning, so then I was the old guy for the whole time, and I was taking orders from 18-year-olds thinking, boy, don't, mm, watch it, watch out, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but the verse we're going to talk about today, and I'd like everyone to open up to it, is 1 Timothy 4.12. Now, 1 Timothy is a Pauline epistle. That means Paul is writing the letter to Timothy, and he's instructing Timothy on how to go about his ministry. Now, let's just read it first before we get into tearing it apart. First Timothy, if you need to know where that is, that's right before 2 Timothy. Chapter 4 and verse 12. He writes, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Just read it again to yourselves. Let it sink in for just a minute. Just a moment. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but instead set an example 
for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Well, and I'll tell you, when I first read that, I was like, yeah, boy, don't look down on me because I'm young. You don't know me. You don't know what I could do. You don't know what God has in store for me. Uh. So I memorized and I memorized. And this verse was really powerful to me because it kind of spoke directly to me and my circumstance, my issues. So let's tear it apart just a little bit. In the first sentence, it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. So, so don't do it. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. And he says, don't let anyone look down on you because what he's doing, what Paul is doing is he sent Timothy off to the church to go minister to the people, to the believers In the very next sentence, it says, but set an example for the believers. So the struggle that he foresees Timothy enduring is not the the unbelievers of the town aren't going to give you any credit because you're young. The struggle he foresees is those who are also studying and ministering and wanting to have a relationship are going to look at you and say, hmm, okay, you're too young to be leading anybody in any sort of spiritual growth, any sort of ministry, anything like that. That's the struggle he foresees. He says, don't let anyone look down on you. But what he says is, don't let those old folks over there decide that you're not worthy because of your age. Right? Okay. He says about the criticism coming from inside the home, right? Again, the the criticism he's worried about is not from outside. It's not from the community. It's not, that's not where he's worried about. He's worried about the inside stuff, the close to home, and that's where it hurts. And we see that all the time. And if we're going to step just outside of ministry for a minute and talk about where that criticism comes from, when you get criticized from people in your life and it's from people that you hardly know or coworkers or some such, it's hurtful and, and you really wish that didn't happen. But when you're receiving that kind of, those barbs from, from inside the family, it hurts even that much more, doesn't it? It's so much more painful. It's so much more painful. And so then we, then we flip the perspective around, right? This is what we like to do. This is what Paul loves to do. I love to read Paul because he does this all the time. Yeah, that sounds great. Oh, we should never do that. Let's not do that. And he says, okay, now real quick, before you go out and scream it from the rooftops, check the mirror for two seconds before you step outside. I'm not laying a hammer down like FBE. We're so bad at doing this kind of thing. I'm just saying, let's internalize the scripture. Let's see how it's relevant to us. The most hurtful criticism that anyone can receive is from their family, is from their very close friends. Are any of us in that kind of back and forth? Are any of us in that kind of relationship? Where we're either receiving or maybe doling out a little bit of criticism thinking, oh, that's okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do some good work. It'll be good, It'll, you know, healthy. Hurtful. The other thing he says is, don't let them look down on you because you are young. But guys, I want to make sure that we understand that the youth was just Timothy's specific thing, right? The, what I love about this verse is it's applicable for then when you get old. Read it the other way. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're too old, but set an example for the believers. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're too fat, but set an example to the believers. Don't let anyone look down on you because of your history, but set an example to the believers. Don't let anyone look down on you because of your occupation, but set an example to the believers. Don't let anyone look down on you because of your net worth, 
but set an example to the believers. Don't let anyone look down on you because of your gender or your race or your ethnicity, but set an example to the believers. Do you see that? None of that matters. I feel like you're close, but not quite. Let me show you something. I have some cups. And these are different cups. Some of these cups are smaller than some of these other cups. Some of these cups are bigger than some of these other cups. Some of these cups are a little more colorful than the other cups. Some are a little more transparent. Hello. Right? Some of them are a little uh, more sporty and in Incidentally, more heroic. Some of them are cuter, right, than the rest of the cups. But what is the purpose of a cup? Any cup, size, shape, color, what is the purpose of the vessel? Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. Which of these is better? Which of these cups turned the water into something better than the water that was poured into it? <laughs> which, which of these serves the purpose better? There... Is there, is there one right answer? Which of, which of these vessels is holding the, the water better? They both are doing the job. They both are filled with the same goodness. And... Though this isn't the point, here's an argument. This one might have a little more in it, but this one has a higher percent capacity filled. So, so neither of these is better than the other? Is that what you're trying to tell me? What if I, what if I put it in, in the colorful one? Now, is it better? What if I put it in the one that's more transparent so we can see it better? Is it better? Which of these vessels is best suited for carrying what's put in it? They're the same. So therefore, how ridiculous does it seem for this cup to decide it's better than this cup? Or, or for this cup to say, I'm better at holding the liquid than you are. Or for this cup to say, see how transparent I am? See how colorful you are? I must be better. Are you following? Don't let anyone look down on you because you're more transparent or more colorful or cuter than they are or bigger than they are or sportier than they are or older than they are or younger than they are or richer than they are, or poorer than they are. None of these is better suited for the overall task of holding what's poured into it. And we are all vessels into which the Holy Spirit flows, we are all equally suited to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you agree with that statement? And Paul does too. And that's why he says, do not be deceived 
by people who are deceived. Don't be fooled by those who don't understand and would dare say anything derogatory toward your ability to be used by God. And just like we do with the criticism, we flip the mirror back on ourselves. I still to this day struggle with inferiorities. I'm I'm not good enough to do something. I'm not, man, I tell you, the thing I struggle with most, I'm not smart enough to do something. And, And I know, I'm a smart guy. I'm not fishing for compliments here. I'm a smart guy. I know I'm a smart guy, but man, I will struggle so hard with I'm not equipped. Here's an example. I've I put in resumes all over everywhere when I first got to McAllen from DC. And I submitted a bunch of resumes that I probably had the minimum qualifications for, but that probably there was someone more qualified for. You get what I'm saying? I, I was I wasn't doing that thing which I have done before, which is like, wow, I'm not qualified for this position at all, but let them tell me no, right? No, that's, that's not it. I met the minimum requirements, but I knew, man, there is somebody out there who is suited, who was built, who is made for that job, and it's probably not me. And I would say this thing where I hand in a resume, and the words that come out of my mouth are, I don't belong there. Or this one, I would say this one a lot, I have no business submitting an application there. And it was a struggle for me because then I would turn back to my very first life verse that says, why are you doing that? Why are you allowing yourself to be the one that looks down? Because what, you're too young, you're not qualified, you're not... That's not where it is. That's not where it is. The second point he makes is when he says, don't let anyone, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. When I hear that, hey, don't let them do that. Right? Hey, don't let them insult you like that. I can't control what comes out of their mouth. How do I not let them do something? They do what they do. We can't control other people but we can control ourselves. And that's why the second part of the verse is equally important. Not just don't let them, but instead set an example. They're going to look down on you because you're young, because they're misguided. Don't let them do that by doing these things. Don't give them a leg to stand on when they look down on you. Instead, show them how wrong they are by setting an example. Setting an example. Setting an example. So it's not about controlling other people. We can't control other people. But we can control ourselves. Amen? Man, there's an idea. And then Paul's writing a letter. He's got limited space. He wants to tell Timothy how, in what ways, to set an example. And he chooses some ways specifically that he's going to encourage him to set that example. In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So when we tear into those individually, so speech, right? Set an example in speech. There are two sides to that coin. Everybody, I think, can immediately identify the one side of the coin, which is careful what you say. Don't say bad things. Don't say bad stuff. Don't curse. Don't insult people. Don't gossip. Don't badmouth. Don't use the name of the Lord in vain. Don't, Don't do the things that are negatively associated with speech. But to, but to not do something 
is only half of the setting of the example. To set an example is a demonstration. Set an example. And so when we're talking about set an example with your speech, he says, make sure that you don't hold back the gospel. There's a lot of biting our tongue. I don't want to say that thing because it's gossip or it's bad or it's foul language or it's whatever. That's only half of the coin of setting the example for speech. The other half is speak. Speak the word of God. Tell people. If you were to tell me today, Tim, I never struggle with telling people about Jesus. I am so quick to open up to anybody. I'd call you a little bit of a liar. Because we all struggle a little bit. And I I, I don't know why. I don't know why I can tell a total stranger about Jesus. But when I'm riding in the truck on the way to that job site, with my buddy who I've known for 15 years, and we knew each other way back even before when I was saved, so, and so I don't know. Right? It's, it's so much harder to, to set an example in speech in that moment. Or what about conduct? Man, conduct's an easy one, right? So speech comes out of the mouth, conduct comes out of the hands. Set an example for the believers in your conduct, in what you do with your hands. That obviously means don't kill people. Don't slap little old ladies. Don't do bad things with your hands. But what about instead of just not doing bad things with your hands, doing good things with your hands? Getting down and picking somebody up. Serving others. Set that example in your conduct. Or in your love. How do you set an example in your love, Tim? That's a, that's a personal kind of emotional thing. I love who I love. I, what can I, how can I set an example in that? Who did Jesus love? Who did Jesus spend his time interacting with during his ministry? The poor, the sinners, the weak, the broken. Did he say when someone came up to him, hey, you're dealing with this sin in your life. When you get that straightened out, I got you. You come find me. Did he say, oh, whoa, you've got leprosy. That's icky. I don't want to talk to you. He poured his love on those people. The way that we can set an example in our love is if you take inventory of the people you love and it's all the people that fit your box of what it's like to be good, of what it's like to be what your visualization and interpretation of of Christian or holy or whatever and you, and you just don't love those other people, then there's some room to grow in being able to set an example for the believers in who you love and how you love. What about faith? There's lots of talk about faith. If you've been with us doing the daily devotional in the Bible app, this whole week has been about faith and how we grow it and how we develop it and how it's meaningful, and how Jesus can help it grow in our lives, and how we have to work on using that faith and and exercise that faith like a muscle, and it becomes stronger and stronger. There's almost nothing more detrimental to the Christian faith than when people look to a well-known Christian during a time of crisis, and they don't see that faith in them. right? When the pastor's the first one throwing babies and women out of the way to jump on the lifeboat, that's going to look bad, unlike the whole church. 
And the last one is purity. Do we set an example for the believers in purity? And this one's a little touchy because most of us think, well, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm a pure um, person. I'm pure. I'm good. It's cool. Except that the challenge is the purity is, is, is an all-encompassing purity, right? So when he says set an example to the believers in purity, he doesn't mean let them see how good you are when you're on, when you're in public. What he's saying is to set an example for the believers in the realm of purity means when nobody's watching, when nobody can see, when nobody will know, when nobody will find out, when it's just you, even then, even then, Set an example for the believers. Don't be an actor. Don't be good about being a Christian when people can see and then be a heathen when they can't. That's not the whole picture. That's not setting an example. And that darkness that cancer will grow and fester and it will destroy all of the rest of your ability to set an example in any of the other ways. So when I reread this, I, I know you saw that. Uh, when I reread this, I decided once and for all, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be looked down on for any of my shortcomings because I am as equipped as Jesus needs me to be to be filled with his Holy Spirit to be used for his will. And so I want to encourage all of us to take that pledge together. Say, I'm not going to be looked down on anymore. Say it. I'm going to set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Do you believe it when you say it, or do you just say it because I said so? Awesome, awesome. We're going to pray in a second, but I also want to have uh, an invitation today. If you feel like, like God has been plucking at your heartstrings, that he's been nagging at you in your life, and, oh, I know, God, I know, I just, give me some time. If you feel like God is trying to speak to you, would you come down? Colin and I will be down at the front. Would you just come down and, and meet with us? We would love that. Let's pray just a minute. Heavenly Father, thank you for, for making each and every one of us exactly how you would have us be made to hold the Holy Spirit as you would have us do so. Help us to remember it, God, when it's hard to remember, when we don't feel like we're doing it right when we slip and we're allowing others to look down on us, help us to overcome that. Help us to be strong and search you out when we're figuring out how to set that example for the believers. Remind us that the example that we are setting is of you. And we love you. It's in your name we pray.